All right, everyone, let's get started. Uh, last time we talked about this, this format called BAM or SAM format, which is the output of all sequence aligners that, that take our FASTQ files, find their location in the genome or the locations in the genome to which they can align, and then do the nucleotide by nucleotide alignment. Um, that BAM file, as we discussed, is, is the starting material for um, looking for differential gene expression, um, assembling genomes, um, looking for chip seek peaks, and as we'll talk about today, it's also uh, what we use to find genetic variation in one or more individuals from a f uh, species that we're, we're studying. So we've aligned DNA say, from uh, a mouse to the mouse genome, and we're looking in these alignments in the BAM file for evidence of true genetic difference in that individual with respect to the reference genome. We can also scale that up to looking at, say, 100 BAM files from 100 different individuals. So not only are we comparing each individual to the reference genome, but actually each individual to each other. Um, and what we're going to talk about today is sort of the, the theory behind that and, and methodologies <coughs> that are used in this area. Okay. Um, right. So let's just thought, start with the goal of what we're trying to do is we're really just trying to find all of the ge inherited genetic variation in one individual's diploid, and I emphasize diploid, we'll get more into this later, diploid genome. So the way we go about that, what would we do if we wanted to find all the inherited variants in an individual's genome? What assay we would do? This is kind of a freebie. We would do RNA-seq, whole genome sequencing, right? And the cheapest way to do that now um, is with Illumina sequencing. It's something, I think here on campus, it's like something about $1,500 to get what's called a 30x coverage of a, of a human genome. We'll talk about why that 30x coverage is a, is a target. Um, so we do whole genome sequencing, and the way we would do that is, is typically either with a uh, buccal swab or ideally with a blood draw where we can isolate white blood cells from, from the blood sample. And then what we get are millions of these uh, cartoon cells. Each cell has a, has a diploid genome in it. I'm representing the whole diploid genome as, as two cartoons of a chromosome, but that represents the whole genome. And I've colored these um, to represent the fact that there's um, two haploid genomes, one inherited from this person's mom and one inherited from this person's dad. Uh, so these individual cells, as we've talked about, are lysed. DNA is extracted from those cells, and adapters are put into randomly inserted into the DNA from all the all the chromosomes of all these cells to create something like three to five hundred base pair fragments that so are then isolated. Remember, on that Illumina flow cell. And those individual fragments from individual chromosomes from individual cells are then amplified into uh, sort of little clusters so that there's enough fluorescent signal for the base collar for Illumina to figure out what the nucleotide sequence was for each of the individual fragments from individual chromosomes. So one read is going to come from either, one sequence, short sequence read is going to come from either this individual's maternal haploid genome or paternal haploid genome. We have no idea the origin of it when we get those sequences off the machine. It's our job to try and figure that out. All right, so if we focus just to, to um, show, show what I just said in more detail, um, you can imagine that each of these individual fragments that are tethered to the flow cell um, come from some random fragment on each of these chromosomes and are assigned you know, arbitrary sequence IDs, sequence one, sequence two, sequence 999, sequence five billion. Um, but the key thing to recognize here is that they come from random locations on, ran from random maternal or paternal chromosomes from random cells. And the output of this then after the clusters are grown and we get and the Illumina technology does its fancy work tracking the, the incorporation of these fluorescently labeled nucleotides 
is we get this fastq file. Now I've labeled this fastq file as if we know the origin of these sequences with respect to the maternal or paternal chromosome, but in reality we don't. But if you think about sort of these, what's ha actually happening, they do come from either the maternal or paternal chromosome. Unfortunately, we don't get that information. Yeah. So is it just like a question of probability? You just have enough adapters or enough places for DNA to bind to that you very confident that you cover the whole genome? Because there's a possibility that like you might not, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so you can actually do that. You could do a back of the envelope calculation. Yeah. You know, the, the human genome is 3 billion nucleotides, haploid. Um, your average fragment length that you sequence is 300 base pairs. So if, every, if those fragments are randomly chosen from random locations and random cells, then yeah, you could figure out how many millions or billions of reads you would need to have uniform coverage of, say, 10 sequences at every position in the genome or, or 30 or 100. Um, but yes, to answer your question directly, it turns out that uh, flow cells now have more than enough real estate on them to get that kind of coverage for a human genome uh, reproducibly. Okay? So th this is the data that we get. We're going to get a massive FASTQ file with billions of anonymous fragments of DNA whose origin comes from individual fragments of individual haploid chromosomes from individual cells. We then take that FASTQ file and we align it all that data to the reference genome. And we're basically, what, what variant detection tools do is they start at the beginning of chromosome one and they just march along the chromosome and look at the sequence alignments and ask is there evidence for true genetic differences in this individual versus the reference genome. And one of the things that, it, one of the biggest challenges is distinguishing true genetic variation from other artifacts like sequencing error. Okay, so um, we, I told you that any two humans differ at an average of around one out of every 700 base pairs. So typically, on average, there's 699 bases where our sequence is identical to the reference genome, and then on average, there's a, a change, and then it may be 500, and then a change, and then maybe 800 bases, etc. So if you wanted to develop a very, very accurate, um, very, very accurate but not very sensitive method for finding genetic variation, it would basically be a one-line program that just says no SNP, no differences, no differences. And it would be right on average 699 out of 700 times. That's very, very accurate, but it has no sensitivity. It has no ability to find genetic variation, just, but just because it's so rare, you could actually very simply make an accurate caller by just saying, guessing that there's nothing there on average. But that's not very useful, right? We actually want to find the situations where there is genetic variation. So um, in this case, since um, this individual actually inherited, say, a T from mom and a T from dad, so that individual is homozygous, T, and it turns out that that's the, the allele of the nucleotide that's in the reference genome. So that's, that's a trivial chore, typically. If you look at the sequence alignments, unless the error rate is really, really high, at this site in the genome, if we looked at the BAM file, basically all the reads should agree with the reference genome and there's nothing really to do. So variant caller is actually not going to report anything there. It's just going to say, oh, this, this individual is the same as the reference genome at this position. It's not going to report anything. So the inference is, by not reporting anything, you can assume that that individual is homozygous for the same allele as the reference genome. So these variant callers are just reporting the sites in the genome, the subset of sites in the genome that are different. And so we know that a, a human genome differs at about one out of every 700 base pairs, which works out to, for SNPs, a, if we sequence my genome, align it to the reference genome and called SNPs, there'd be about four million of them. So variant callers are gonna report uh, a f file called a VCF file, which we'll talk about in a couple lectures, that will essentially have four million lines in it that are the genetic variants, that, uh, positions where I differ. So this case is actually quite easy. An individu individual is homozygous for the reference allele. Um, so in this case, you know, all the, 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 all the, at that site, 
all the reads from all the chromosomes from all the cells should have a T at that position in the genome, unless there's a sequencing error, right? So if we aligned all the reads to that locus, what we should see in this cartoon form is a pileup. This is the reference genome. And these are the individual sequences that have been mapped and aligned to this position. And what you see is this stack up of, of alleles that are all T, and, and which is the same as the reference genome. Make sense? This is kind of the easy case. Uh, a harder case is a scenario where the individual is actually homozygous for a different allele than the reference genome. So in this case, uh, this, this cartoon man that we presented on slide one it inherited a C from both his mom and his dad. And so what should happen is all the sequencing reads that sample that allele, um, because the two chromosomes have uh, C and C, all these sequencing reads um, should, should have a C and C at that site, um, except for sequencing error. And so in the ideal case, what we get is something like this, where the referent, the variant color is marching along the reference genome and all of a sudden gets, it's boring, 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 everything's the same, then it gets to this site and says, oh, wait a second, there's something interesting here. The reference genome is a T, but there's this big pileup of evidence that suggests that this individual is not T. So what's, what's one of the fundamental challenges here? What does the variant color have to figure out, though? Yeah. Right. So one really extreme case could be that um, the truth is this individual is not homozygous C, but um, every single read somehow got the same exact base calling error at the same exact site. And that could lead to a false um, prediction of homozygous C. But what, what information do we have to sort of hedge that problem? Yeah. We have a depth of about 10. Yep. So there's depth. And so it's the more sequences that you see that say the same allele, the less probable it is that all those came from a, a ostensibly random error. But what's the other thing that we get along with the sequence, the nucleotide? Yeah. Uh, base quality, right? So we get the, the likelihood that that uh, base call is wrong. So um, if, if these are all uh, base quality five, maybe we would be a little suspicious. These, these uh, yeah, there's 10 or whatever pieces of evidence that suggest a C, but they're all highly probable. It's, the Lumina is saying these are all likely to be something other than C. So maybe we probably, a variant color would probably predict that this individual is homozygous C, but it would reflect that uncertainty about the genotype that comes from the uncertainty um, for the nucleotides at this site. Okay. Now the last scenario is by far the hardest, and um, it comes from uh, some probability theory that we'll we'll practice today in class. Um, but imagine imagine the individual actually inherited two different alleles from from mom and dad. So this individual is heterozygous at this site, inherited a C and a T. Um, and so if so, the sequencing reads that we get on the, on the flow cell should be roughly, uh, should be a mixture of C's and T's at that site. And if an individual is heterozygous and diploid, what do we expect about that mixture? What fraction of the reads do we think should be a C? Yeah. Yeah, 50-50, because the individual is diploid. Now, will it always be 50-50? What if there's seven reads aligned? Can it be 50-50? No. If it's an odd number, by definition, it literally just can't be 50-50, right? But it should be pretty close to that. And that pretty close is part of the challenging math that goes into variant calling, and it's part of the challenging math that goes into specifically calling these heterozygotes, because it's a mixture of two things that are sampled randomly from all the DNA fragments and all the cells. And random sampling, uh, if, if you've had any probability or stats, that's randomness is, is really what underlies uh, p-values and how, how confident we are that an observation is real versus uh, coming from uh, something that could be generated by chance.
Okay, so if we sequenced, if we roughly randomly sampled all these alleles from the reference genome, or sorry, from the individual's genome and align them to the reference, we'd get this pile up of a mixture of two alleles. Um, I've drawn this, I've labeled these sequences by uh, two, with two different colors that re reflect the two different um, haploid genomes that the individual inherited from his parents. And if it's real, there should be some, some consistency in the sequences that come from one genome versus the other. Now, when we align sequences to the reference genome, we don't get that coloring. I'm giving it as a visual cue, but one of the things that hopefully we'll see later on is that sometimes, especially if you have DNA from the parents as well, you can figure out if there's any con inconsistencies in what was apparently transmitted to the, to the kid. In this case, we just have DNA from the from the child, so we don't we don't really know the origin uh, of of these reads. But as um, as someone said, it's roughly I think there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven reads aligned. Three are T and four are C, and that's as close to a 50-50 ratio as you can get with seven things, right? But sometimes it might be two and five. Sometimes it might be one and six. Sometimes it might be seven and zero, and that's the problem. The data may not always reflect the truth. All right, so that gets at, um, it's sort of a teaser for, for this question. Um, I've kind of alluded to this. Does anyone have any intuition about why finding heterozygotes is harder? It is a sampling problem, um, and we'll go into the details of, of why. And the, the reality is that this can be thought of as what's called a binomial random variable. So if it, at every site in my genome where I am heterozygous, um, let's say we sequence my genome to roughly 30x coverage, that means that on average, every site in the genome has an average of 30 reads. But there are going to be some sites in the genome where I'm heterozygous, but there's only 10 reads. There's going to be other sites in the genome where there's 34 reads at a heterozygous site. And we, we can think of each of those reads as a coin flip. And a coin has, a fair coin has two sides, heads and tails, that have equal probability of, of revealing themselves when you flip it. So by analogy, the two alleles at sites where I'm heterozygous can be thought of as these two states in a binomial random variable. And the probability of sampling, say, uh, what was it, C? A C or a T is, should be 0 0.5 and 0 0.5, leading to Simone's intuition about this 50-50 ratio of reads, right? Okay, so I think this is somewhat intuitive, if, if not completely intuitive to many of you, but just to get everyone on the same sort of foundation here, because we're going to be thinking about these random processes more and more as we talk about other genomic experiments. We're going to we're going to do something that I hope will be fun. Um, <laughs> so we're not going to go too much into the, into the math, but um, there's, there's a nice plug and chug formula that you can use for um, modeling um, the probability of seeing, um, say, three, three heads when you do 10 flips or when you do seven flips. And that N is the number of flips, and K is the number of, say, uh, heads that we observe given uh, in flips. And that, that um, leads to um, a binomial distribution, assuming that the chances of seeing heads or tails on each successive flip, or by analogy, the chances of seeing C versus T in each successive read is independent of all other. So when we see a C in one read, that, the, the fact that we saw a C in one read has no bearing on um, whether or not we see a C or a T in the next read. And that, that should be the case uh, because we're essentially randomly sampling reads from cells. So it's almost like the Illumina sequencers is, you know, um, if we're looking at one heterozygous site in the genome, it's basically flipping coins for us behind the scenes. Um, so, you know, thinking through this, what's the probability of seeing uh, one tail in three flips of a fair coin? Assuming the probability of seeing a tail is 0 0.5, which it should be. Well, you just basically plug that into this formula. Um, 
this, this, if you're not familiar with this notation, this is from combinatorics. It's called, uh, you read this as um, n choose k, or th in this case, 3 choose 1. It's all the different ways that you can um, uh, get uh, mixtures of heads and tails with three trials. So like two tails, one head, two heads, one tail, et cetera. Three, three tails, zero heads, three heads, zero tails. Um, so we plug that math in, and essentially what you get is the pro is the pro this, this math, which underlies the binomial distribution, tells us that the probability of seeing one tail with three flips uh, is 0 0.375, okay? because of all the different ways that you could get that combination. Now, this P is, is 0 0.5, because we're assuming a fair coin. But if you know there's some bias in the experiment, like maybe... Maybe there's maybe it, there is some bias in being able to see certain alleles when we when we um, do whole genome sequencing, and if so, we could update that probability to be something like 0 0.549. So maybe the probability of seeing tails is 0 0.49, or the probability of seeing T is 0 0.549, and therefore the probability of seeing the other allele or the other side of the coin is one minus that or it has to add up to 1, right? So 0 0.51. So going back here, the reference allele is T. We're assuming it's a 0 0.5 probability, and I'd say it probably is uh, most of the time. 0 0.5 probability of sampling a C or a T allele. But can you think through what, what, which of these two alleles might there be some potential bias against? given what we've learned about sequence alignment. Yeah. That's right. You could imagine that there might be scenarios where because the C is different than the reference allele, you know, every one of those reads is being aligned to the reference genome using that smith waterman algorithm. And there's a penalty for mismatches, right? So you could imagine that sequence aligners have um, a maximum number of mismatches that it tolerates before it says, nope, I'm not going to align that read to that location. So if there's a lot of sequencing errors in the read, plus this true genetic difference, some of those reads that have the genetic difference and the sequencing errors might not get mapped here. So there'd be a slight suppression of that uh, C allele, which could lead to um, a, a non 0 0.5, 0 0.5 probability balance. It might be like 0 0.55 for the reference allele and 0 0.45, yeah, 0 0.45 for the non reference allele. So that's called reference bias. All right. So now we're going to walk through uh, a handcrafted experiment to think through why we need lots of sequencing reads. Uh, and if you want to do this math in, in R, you could use this D binome function where we say the number of successes, the number of trials, and the probability of success. All right, so what we're going to do, I'm going to hand everyone a coin. Uh, if you could, you guys want to do it? We need more data still. So we're going to do a coin, and we're going to enter our data. We're going to keep track of your mic. Um, if you could just pass these down. We're going to keep track of how many heads and tails we get. And keep in the back of your mind that heads and tails are, we're thinking about this in the context of heterozygous sites. So heads and tails are two different alleles uh, that are possible in he uh, sequencing reads at heterozygous sites. Yeah? Uh, the spreadsheet, I think it's... Uh, Oh, blocked? Okay. All right, let me fix that. Thank you. Okay. Let me see what I can do here. Get shareable link. Edit. Thank you. Okay. 
Uh, could you try that again to see if it works? It's open? Okay. So I've, I've done this experiment once. Um, so as you can see, there's three columns. We're keeping, we're going to do three experiments. Three experiments. Um, in each experiment, we're going to flip either 5, 15, or 30 times. And in each time, you might want to flip and keep track of um, two columns, how many times you've flipped and how many heads you've gotten, because actually for the, the 30 flips experiment, I, can't, I probably couldn't track those things in my head. But you're going to flip five times as the first experiment and enter the number of heads that you get in this column, in this second column. Also, uh, write down your ID. Um, we're not grading this. This is just to uh, maybe ask particular users questions. Um, and then we're going to do it again for 15 tosses and then again for 30 tosses, and we're going to look at the data. Okay? So let's, uh, let's flip some coins. Does everyone have one? Can I get the bucket back? Because I want to do it here. Yeah. Hi. Did, um, can you go back to refresh the slides and take the link again and open it again? You guys can keep the coins. Sorry to the people that got pennies instead of quarters, and congrats to the person that I think got a pound. This was a little easier when we had a classroom with desks, but it's okay. We got time. All right. Two. Do this again. Ooh, wow. Pretty good roll there. I haven't held a penny in a while. It feels like lighter than before. <laughs> Had to raid an old coin jar this morning. Just haven't looked at it in a long time. All right. Okay, it looks like most people are done with uh, the first experiment. Looks like we're starting to wrap up the second experiment. Okay, I'm going to change the column names here. Oop, this was 15, right? no one got 10 or more heads in the second experiment. We'll see. It's not done yet. Got a lot of nines. Should have brought my glasses. Anyone bored yet? 
Oh, they were in. <laughs> oh, yeah, my daughter was probably there. She was sick a lot that year. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> she was sick a lot that year. <laughs> oh, someone got 10 out of 15. Somebody's got numbers in um, odd columns. Oh, I, I see. That's your temporary variable. I like it. All right, so we're getting there. Let's give it anyone 10 seconds. Looks like we got a couple people wrapping up. U114738108, we need your last bit of data. 9955-64169, getting there. Pressure's on. There's feedback that it's too hard to flip a dime. I agree. It's hard. What's that? <laughs> okay, so well, you got. Sounds like you got thirty out of thirty. <laughs> I, th I think. I think that might be user error, but we'll just pick a random number between one and thirty and put it in there. Okay. Well. If it's a nice choice. Okay, it looks like everyone's done. Uh, 64169, do you want to put one in there? Or it looks like you graded out. Board? Broken coin? Okay, got it. All right, so I'm going to clean this data up, and we're going to do a little bit of data exploration to hopefully make a few points. And get rid of some empty rows. Delete rows. Is that all the empty ones? Um, anonymous goose, can you put one in there? And uh, anonymous tiger. Okay. Goose. Goose. Okay. Yeah, okay. I don't believe 22, but sure. Okay. All right. So. Um, we're going to use R uh, to do a little bit of data exploration to hopefully po prove a couple of points. How many, just so I know how foreign this is going to be, has everyone opened R before, know what it is at least? Ever, has anyone written a command or made a plot in R? How many people? Okay, this won't be too foreign then. All right, so there, one thing there uh, I should mention is there's a kind of cool package for R called uh, Data Pasta. Um, which allows you, so I can load this package, and I can take this, if I do it right, which I may not, I can take this data set from this experiment that we all did together, and I can, um, if I remember how, paste in this data in a way that makes it a data frame. I don't remember how to do it now. Add-ins. Paste as data frame. So it takes that whole data and formats it so it's a data frame. And then I can call this um, tosses. And then load this up. Boom. And then tosses. And now I've got this cool data frame, which should um, look very similar to what we saw in Google Sheets. All right. That's great. Uh, so we can now poke around. Um, if, if this was a random, if this was truly random, we could do a, what's called a simulation. Um, I simulated, in this case, I assume 30, 30 students, 30 flippers, or think of this as 30 sites, heterozygous sites in the genome. Um, they each do five tosses, and we're measuring um, the probability of tails. 
So this is, this is the bar plot that we would get from that binomial distribution with a trials, five trials, um, and a probability of success of 0 0.5. So let me just make that plot in R so we can see that. Okay, and what you can see is that we would expect most of the time the mean or the expected value is three. Um, and maybe if we did more experiments, so maybe if there are 100 students, it'd be, now it shifts between two and three. So what is the expected value? It's really two and a half, right? But you can't actually observe two and a half successes out of five trials. So there's some, there's some variability. So if I do this again, it's going to shift. And that, that gets at, there's randomness in this, uh, even though the binomial distribution is governing the probability of seeing things, we're, we're doing 100 random trials. So you can think of that as 100 heterozygous sites in the genome with DEP5. And the ratio of reads supporting one allele versus the other is going to be, is going to fluctuate just like this. Okay. So this is what we see with a, this is what we expect to see if it's truly random data. We're letting R do this simulation for us. But we just did the simulation with our, with our hands and with these dirty coins. Um, so I can do the same uh, bar plot. This is going to test my R skills here. But I created a data frame called tosses. And I can, I want to make a table of this. Bar classes, and I called that variable toss five. I probably broke this, so let's just laugh at me when I get it wrong. Oh, no, I got it right. So that's that's what our actual data look like, and this is what the simulated data look like. Pretty similar, right? Um, two, it looks like two people got zero he uh, tails. What was it? Heads we were tracking. Two people got zero heads out of five. Yep, that matches up. And looks like one person got five out of five. But most of us got two, three, or four, which matches the theory. Okay? The point I want to make, though, is if we're only doing five tosses, or we have, by analogy, five aligned sequencing reads at a heterozygous site, what is zero? Let's think of zero as the number of alternate reads aligned. Let's say call heads the number of alternate reads aligned. If the truth is that the individual is heterozygous at that site, but zero alternate re le reads were aligned, then we cannot detect the fact that that individual is heterozygous, right? Now, if there's one alternate read, or one tail aligned versus five, yeah, we, we might start to guess that, ooh, perhaps this individual is heterozygous, but what if that read that, um, that alternate allele is, has a low base quality. Then maybe, again, the truth is the individual's heterozygous, but we, we only have one observation, and it's a crap observation. So maybe, we again, we'd say, no, this individual is probably homozygous for the reference allele. I don't believe they're heterozygous. Okay. So with only five coin flips or five aligned sequencing reads, we have low power to detect... Um, heterozygous sites in the genome. So if, if the average depth of coverage across the genome is five, then there's going to be a lot of sites. Uh, but this was 100 trials, but if we, if we did, I said there's 4 million variable sites in a typical genome, so there might be like a million heterozygous sites. Let's do that simulation. Instead of 100 uh, experiments, we're doing a million for a million different heterozygous sites in the genome. Look, there's going to be something like 25,000 sites that are heterozygous where we have no information to tell us that that individual is heterozygous. That's not great. That's going to be a disappointing experiment. All right. So um, we're, I think we're probably starting to see what's, what's going on here. Um, let's say we do um, 30 experiments again. But this time, instead of five flips, we're doing 15 flips, or there's 15 sequencing reads aligned. Um, we'll get a bar plot that looks a little bit different than that. And, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a, a wide range. It goes from 3 to 12. Um, but there's no zeros. There's not a single case where there were zero uh, heads 
flipped or zero alternate alleles. And that's kind of what we're looking for. We want enough coin flips where, where, where we can be kind of certain that at pretty much every heterozygous site in the genome, we've done enough coin flips or enough aligned sequencing reads where we've sampled that alternate allele at least once. Um, so let's see what our actual data looks like. So the, remember this for me, the range in the simulation was a minimum of, of, of three alternate alleles when we had 15 reads to a maximum of um, 12 when we had uh, 15 reads. So let's look at what our data looks like. So I'll just change that to toss 15. And okay, similar, three, a range of three to 12 or three to 10. Okay, so again, even in our own experiment, we always had at least one observation of the alternate allele, or at least two, at least three, I guess. All right, does that follow intuition? So this is why we need more experiments, more deeper sequencing data to, to have um, more trials to capture that alternate allele at heterozygous sites. Now, why do we go for 30x coverage? Well, that's the simulation, this 30 toss experiment. And if in the simulated data, there was not a case where we had less than 10 observations of the alternate allele when we did 30 coin flips, okay? So that's pretty nice. If we have 10 observations, chances are, even if a couple of them have low base qualities associated with them, the remainder will have sufficient, um, sufficiently high base quality that we would be confident in, in calling this a heterozygote. So let's do that experiment again. So again, we're doing um, 30 students doing 30 flips each, probability of seeing the alternate allele is 0.5, and it's a little bit different this two time, but a range between 8 and 22. Now, let's, let's do that um, a million times, which is like all the heterozygotes that might be in a genome. Now we get this nice distribution. Does anyone recognize that distribution? It kind of looks like something you're probably familiar with a normal or a Gaussian distribution. And with really large sample size, a binomial distribution converges to a, a Gaussian distribution. So we've done a lot of trials, a million trials, and, and it, it, you know, and even with a million, there was not a single site out of those million where we had less than three uh, pieces of evidence for the alternate allele. Yeah? Is there any reason to doubt um, that each port, every part of the genome has like an equal chance of picking up an adapter and getting a chance for both cells. Great question. Um, yeah, this is this is theoretical. In reality, there are parts of the genome where we we really violate this assumption. So um, we already touched upon one potential source of violating that, which is just this reference bias. It's harder to align the alternate allele because of sequence aligners are counting mismatches that arise either through sequencing error or true genetic variation. In human, most of the differences that we would see are probably going to be, um, in an individual read, are going to be maybe, you know, one sequencing error and one genetic difference. But in, in species like Drosophila, where the polymorphism rate is so high, you're going to have, some reads might have multiple true polymorphisms in them. So you sort of have to tune the aligner to that. But to your, to your question, um, yeah, there are parts of the genome that are far more repetitive. So we would have less opportunity to align sequencing reads there and actually have no power to detect genetic variation. And in reality, when we talk about whole genome sequencing, what we're really talking about is 95% um, of the genome sequencing. We have, for about 95 to 97% of the genome, we can confidently sample DNA using Illumina sequencing and align it to the reference genome such that we can find genetic variation. There's a sort of a, a difficult a recalcitrant 3% of the genome where that's really, really difficult. So this, this is the thought experiment, but th there are definitely sites in the genome that are har they're harder to capture heterozygotes. So let's look what our data looks like. Um, last bit. Yeah, and it's sort of the same range, 10 to 22. So the take home message here is when, when we're doing any sequencing experiment, this is our first example of it, we're, it's a so-called counting experiment. We're using the DNA sequencing reads that align to the reference genome as a proxy for the truth that's happening in that 
genome. So we're using sequencing reads, we're counting sequencing reads that support one allele versus the other to infer the genotype of that individual at all these sites in the genome. And that, that inference has error associated with it because of sampling error. You know, we sequence to an average of 30x, but um, there are going to be sites in the genome where there's only 10 sequencing reads. And so we're at, that, at those sites, we're more prone to this bias of one seeing one allele at a greater than 50-50 ratio than the other because of sampling error. Right? Um, so the, the sequence of genome to 30x coverage is really this added, is, is sort of the rule of thumb so that we have reasonable power to detect all the true heterozygous variants that are in the genome um, and overcome um, the, the randomness or the variance associated with, with low, uh, small sample sizes, okay? And that's, that's where that comes from. Okay, so um, depth, this depth tackles two things though. It, it tackles both this, this, ability, this requirement that we sample both alleles. Uh, in this case, we have a depth of seven. But it also helps overcome when some of those sampled alleles have low base quality. So if the sequencing technologies made no mistakes, we wouldn't have to worry about the second problem. But we really have two problems when finding heterozygotes. We have the sampling both alleles, uh, the coin flipping problem, but also some of those coin flips uh, might be tarnished on one side. We, we can't even recognize that it's one side or the other, really dirty coin. So that's uh, low base qualities. So if we have if we have lots of reads, chances are we're going to have some that have higher base quality scores, say 30, where we can be more confident that the individual is heterozygous. If they were all low quality like this, we'd maybe say, ah, maybe it's just actually T's and this individual is truly homozygous T and we can't really trust those base qualities. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay. Um, so let's look at real data. Everything I've drawn so far is just cartoons. Um, in the last homework, one of the assignments was to work through this IGV tutorial. I don't know if anyone's had a chance to look at it yet. Um, but let's look at some real data. Uh, on the bottom, and just to orient you, in IGV is this, um, this nucleotide sequence, and this is the reference genome. I think this is build 37 of the human genome. And each of these gray rectangles is a, an aligned sequencing read from the FASTQ file. So this is basically a glimpse into a BAM file. So the, the sequences in FASTQ file have been aligned and then I've opened up this BAM file in IGV and I've jumped to some arbitrary locus in the genome. And what you can see is all these reads at this particular position where the reference genome is a T, uh, all these reads with the exception of a couple here have a C allele. Uh, and that suggests, given that it's something like, I don't know, by I, 38 out of 40 reads are C, that this individual is homozygous CC. Does that make sense? These, these red labeled reads, uh, these color, actually align their, their mate, either their mate or, this is paired in sequencing, or the, either the sequence or its mate align to some other chromosome or it's been flagged as a weird alignment. Um, and if you squint, even this, this read down here, it's a C, but it's, it's gray. It's a very grayish blue C. And the, the intensity of the blueness, or lack thereof, reflects the certainty about that base quality. So the higher the base quality, the darker blue the C will be. So this is, it was called the C, but maybe it's a Fred quality score of five or something. And then there's another one up here that's a low quality C. And then this one is just a straight up match of the T in the reference genome. But if you look at this read, hopefully you can see it. There's lots of differences in that read with respect to the reference genome. Can you guys see that? So that, the mapping quality or the alignment quality of that read is, is suspect. So um, if a variant caller is doing the right thing, it's probably hopefully ignoring that read a little bit in favor of other reads that have just this one mismatch where the true genetic variant is and there's no other mismatches with respect to the reference genome. Yeah? So when you see 
Yeah. Like this read? Yeah. Yeah, it's it, it's probably, I mean, there, there are a couple sources of this, but I would say the most likely thing is that is a read that was in a cluster on the flow cell that was really close to another cluster. And both of those re the reads that come out of those two adjacent clusters have lots of mismatches because the fluorescence bl is bleeding through from one cluster into the other and there's just a lot of confusion in the base calling. Okay, um, so here's a data set where the individual is heterozygous. Um, actually, two different individuals that are heterozygous at the same site. So in this case, I'm not showing the reference genome, but I can tell you what the reference allele is. Blue is for C. So this bar chart, stack bar chart at the top here, basically shows you that among all the sequencing reads, there's roughly a 50-50 ratio of T's and C's. So if you look at that, you can see all the T's, and you can infer that all the ones that are gray at the site are C. Okay, This individual as well, the bar chart is roughly 50-50 uh, red and blue, or T and C. Um, but which of these two would you be more confident in? In, in the fact that, in the prediction that the individual is heterozygous, and why? Why? Yeah, there's more data, more coin flips, so there's less, a, a lower likelihood that that observation of C's and T's comes from random chance, and it's actually the biology. Um, does that make sense? Okay. Uh, and so, you know, the, the, the signal-to-noise problem in variant calling is finding sites like this, where it's a true heterozygous site where this individual has a SNP with respect to the reference genome and the CFTR gene here, versus the noise, which is sequencing error. Now, we're lucky, because today, if you're working with modern high-throughput sequencing data, the error rates are really low. So if you look at this, you know, this is maybe a, uh, this is a 98 base pair window. So each of the, we're looking at a 98 base pair snippet in the genome. And there's, I don't know, something like 40 or 50 sequencing reads there. So 40 or 50 times 98 nucleotides, roughly in this window. And I can spot like two sequencing errors. So that sequencing, the sequencing error rate would be something like two divided by 50 times 98. Uh, which is a 4 in 10,000 error rate, which is pretty low. That might be a bit generous to the true error rate, but it gives you a sense that nowadays, you know, when you see something like this, you can be pretty confident that it's a true genetic variant. In the earlier days when the error rate was much higher, the, the signal-to-noise ratio was much lower, so a lot, of the, a lot of the predictions were actually false positives generated by sequencing error or uh, mistakes made in... Um, PCR in an early cycle that gets amplified, okay? All right, but it's not always so easy. Um, there's, um, if, if errors are truly random and look like this, we can really tease out true signal from noise, but that assumes that the errors are random. But as it was asked about earlier, there are parts of the genome that are just really difficult to align sequences to um, and that leads to what's called systematic error. So it's the, the, the aligner making the same mistake over and over again. So you end up piling up sequences at the same location that have the cons a, a consistent error, and that consistency makes it masquerade as true genetic variation when it's actually uh, just systematic error. So for sequencing technologies, what we'd really like is random error, if errors are made randomly, then we can overcome that random error by just sequencing more data, right? We go from 15x coverage to 30x coverage, and all the errors that are made are random, then that boost in coverage really improves our signal to noise. But if it's systematic error, there's no increase in coverage that will overcome that if it's systematically making the same mistake, okay? Um, we also, this is... Um, 
less of an issue for whole genome sequencing these days because PCR, very little PCR is required, if at all. But for some capture experiments like exome and perhaps uh, other experiments that I'm not as well versed in like ChIP-seq or ATAC-seq, there might be some PCR that's required. And you can get some bias, uh, strand bias in PCR. So one of the things that we see here, I just want to point out, is this, there's this beautiful pileup of C alleles at this site, which suggests, I mean, if, if, if the variant color is naive and just has blinders on, it's looking just at this site and at that pileup, it's going to say, yep, nailed it, that's a, that's a homozygous C. But if it zoomed out and looked at the bigger picture, what it would recognize is all these sequences are aligned on the same strand. And that's unexpected, right? If we've sampled reads randomly from individual strands, from individual haplotypes, from individual cells, at a variable site, a site where an individual truly has a genetic difference, we should not only see uh, a mixture of two alleles, but each of those two alleles, or whatever allele we've sampled, should be on a mixture of forward and reverse strand, because it's just random what, what strand of um, DNA we've actually uh, sampled from. Okay? So seeing, seeing a strand bias like this would be uh, an alert that, yeah, this is probably the result of some hybridization bias or PCR bias that's, that's led to this. And so we'd be less trust, trusting of that apparent difference. Um, Another thing is that we can get systematic error. So this is an example of systematic error. Another example of systematic error is a situation like this first one um, where these reads just have lots of differences in them. And that seems to be much higher a much higher apparent um, polymorphism rate and error rate than we'd expect. So I told you that and let's imagine this is human data. I told you that any two humans differ on average about one out of every 700 base pairs. So in this 41 base pair window, to see one, two, three, like four, five, six, seven, eight, eight out of 40, so what's one out of five um, sites that are different is highly unexpected. So variant callers should be aware of this. Um, some aren't, but I think the more important lesson is why this happens. It, it comes from this notion of paralogy, where there's sequence. We, told, we talked about the fact that the human genome is repetitive. So there are parts of the genome that are so repetitive, so similar, that sequence aligners can make mistakes and say there's copy A and copy A prime, and they're like 99.99% identical at the nucleotide level. So when we get a sequencing read that comes from either of those two loci, the, the, a sequence aligner might be confused about wh whether the read belongs here, at copy A prime, or here, copy A. Now, you might imagine, well, if it's confused, maybe just, it just makes a guess and it should distribute the reads equally between those two copies. But what if it doesn't? What if there's some, something about the code uh, the decisions that that aligner makes where it always puts the read on one copy versus the other. That would lead to a pileup of all the DNA um, from the two loci at one locus only. And so any d genetic differences that exist between those two loci, I said they're 99.99 identical, those differences will be stacked up at that one spot, which would lead to something like this. And it's worse, worse still because the reference... The reference genome is, in fact, a bit depleted for these paralogous sequences. So if something is really competitive, uh, repetitive, it tends to be collapsed. Say the truth is there's three copies in most individuals, but the reference genome only has two. So now every single genome that we sequence, whether it's mouse or human, this is true in all vertebrate genomes, really, um, that third copy, the DNA from that third copy, gets put on either of the two copies that are in the reference genome, and therefore any genetic differences that exist in that third copy of the repeat in most walk, humans walking around get stacked up there and you'd see something like this. Um, I guess this is yet another example of like looking at your data. Um, if there's regions like, you know, um, regions in the genome where there's just a, like a, uh, 
smattering of genetic variation at high density, like look at those regions, trying to figure out, should I trust those? Is it likely driven by paralogy? Um, and I, I cite this paper called FLAGS uh, because it actually reports a bunch of genes um, like uh, mucins, uh, olfactory receptors in the human genome, lots of these big paralogous gene families where, um, I, I forget, I don't know. Anybody know how many olfactory receptors humans have? It's a lot. We don't have as many as mice, um, but there's a lot of them. So a lot of false positives in studies of human genetic variation arise in these genes that are part of big paralogous gene families for this mismapping problem that I talked about. So the, 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 the result of this paper is essentially like a table of genes that you should be weary of. Don't trust these genes because of, of this paralogy. Um, and if you've done any rare disease analysis or any, any work like that, um, often you get a lot of candidate variants in these genes because of of problems like this arising because of paralogy. Yeah. Um, so what are the three sections here? Is it the same? Oh, I'm sorry. These are these are these are three individuals. So these are three different BAM files, um, but just showing that there's there's sort of lots of this one's the worst where there's lots of differences, but there's there's a, even even a high number of, of apparent errors in each of these other two genomes. So this would be like um, individual one genome, my genome, and somebody else's genome all at the same locus. So three different so-called tracks in IGV. So in IGV, you can open up a handful of BAM files at a time. Once you get above eight or 10, it starts to struggle, but you can look at a few genomes at once. Okay, um, most of what I've, pretty much everything I've been talking about today is, is talking about in, um, SNPs, so spelling differences, single nucleotide polymorphisms with respect to the reference genome. But um, there's about four million single nucleotide polymorphisms per genome, but there's about seven or 800,000 insertion deletion polymorphisms per genome as well. So we need to be able to find those as well. It, it, finding indels um, requires the same sampling theory, the binomial sampling theory that we talked about. We need depth of coverage to capture whether you know, the allele we inherited from dad had no insertion, but the allele we inherited from mom has an insertion. The, the more difficult problem with indels is that getting this nucleotide by nucleotide alignment registration consistent across all sequences is harder. And that's because I hopefully um, I can hopefully I explain the Smith Waterman alignment algorithm well enough that you could get a sense where um, if there's both mismatches and gaps that have to be opened in that alignment uh, matrix that we that we follow with the traceback, um, that can lead to slight inconsistencies as to where the gap opens and closes in those alignments from read to read. And so when a sequence aligner comes along and looks at the alignments here, it's saying, oh, well, some of these reads say the, the deletion starts here and ends here, but others say it starts here and ends here. So it has to sort of squint and sort of fade out a little bit and look at sort of what the consensus is among all these alignments. Um, there are some tools, uh, one's called CIRMA, um, GATK, which uh, is sort of the most widely used genetic variant color, kind of does this built in. Um, but the idea is that you can do something called multiple sequence alignment, which you've probably heard of in the context of aligning protein sequences to one another to find homology. Um, you can align, you can do a multiple sequence alignment of all the DNA sequencing reads to find, sort of clean up this, these noisy alignments at a true uh, deletion site into something that's more consistent across the reads. So that's, this is taking the alignments from an older aligner called BFAST. And, and cleaning up or scrubbing those alignments with a tool called CIRMA, and the result is you get this nice um, consistency across the reads, which simplifies the detection of that deletion uh, via tools like GATK or whatever. Um, so uh, it's 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 sort of taken for granted that variant calling is just solved given how uh, cheap and easy it is to sequence whole genomes to r ridiculously high accuracy. Um, but the, the truth is that we can't accurately detect all the genetic variation that's in um, a human or a mouse or a, a fly genome. There's just parts of the genome 
that are so difficult that we just we miss some of the variants that are there or make false predictions. Um, you can't really make too much out of this table. The, the main point is that these are a bunch of variant calling tools on the y-axis or rows. And these columns are um, the performance. What fraction of variants that they call at what false positive rate uh, summarized as accuracy, essentially. Um, and this was part of a, a bake-off. Uh, I for, actually forget which one this was. Oh, yeah, this was run by the FDA. And basically just trying to find what are the highest performing variant callers. Because you could imagine if you're a diagnostic lab where a doctor sends off genome or exome, uh, DNA for exome or genome testing, you want the most accurate, accurate predictions possible. You don't want to falsely predict that someone has a variant that would be interpreted as pathogenic. And it, more importantly, I think, you don't want to miss something that's actually there. Um, so there's, there's still, even though variant detection is, is um, quite, quite good these days, there's still um, room to be done. And what I'll talk about in a couple lectures is it's even the performance of finding things like copy number changes or translocations or inversions or duplications or deletions so-called structural variants, it's much harder. It's, it's really still basically a not solved problem. Um, okay, so wrapping up, to next, next lecture, what we're gonna talk about is um, some more of the theory behind variant detection, um, as well as getting into, um, we're gonna start talking about formats and, and other things to consider when doing variant detection. Um, so I'm going to sign, after next lecture, I'm going to sign a short homework, which is actually just trying to use a BAM file uh, to do some variant detection um, and work you through just look, looking at what the data look like and, and hopefully opening up things in IGV. Um, any questions? No? All right. Thanks. I'll see you Thursday.